Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Easy Peasy with the Smithsonian. I'm Allison Leitner. I'm an instructional designer here at the Smithsonian. And here with my colleague, Ashley Naranjo. Um, and we have some special guests, Jim Reese from the Washington International Schools joining us, as well as Cher and Carol. Um, we are excited to have you here today. This week's going to be a little bit different from what we've done in the past. We're going to be, we're calling it our meta week, where we're talking to teachers about how they really use uh, Project Zero Thinking routines in their classroom practices. And on Wednesday, we'll be talking about how um, they, uh, how museum educators use them. So, um, so it should be a really interesting week. Uh, as, before we get started, as always, we're going to um, have you think for a minute and post in the chat your answer to a question. So what we'd like to do is type one or two words that come to mind when you think about um, building a culture of thinking. So use the chat to do that, and I will turn it over to Ashley. Thanks so much, Allison. My name is Ashley Naranjo, and I am a museum educator with the Smithsonian. Um, and today, what you'll see uh, in our webinar, um, we have two very experienced educators that will share kind of the, the how and the why of what they do when they implement Project Zero thinking routines um, in a classroom setting, whether it's uh, in person in the physical space or also now in distance learning spaces as well. And then at the end of the session, what we'll do is we'll also share a Smithsonian Learning Lab collection that has all of the resources that we've talked about for today's session, including some links to other programming and projects that might give you kind of a deeper view into um, what Carol and Cher's experience have been. So for today's session, I will kind of be hiding behind the scenes, and then you'll see me again um, at the end of the session to share some of those resources with you. I'd like to turn it over to Jim from the Washington International School to help uh, introduce our next guest. Great. Thank you, Ashley. And thanks, Allison. It's, um, it's great to be here again. And I'm already seeing a lot of really interesting responses coming through um, in, the, in the chat, in the live comments. And we will pull some of those as we go through today's session. Um, I'd just say a little bit about myself, and then I'll introduce, <laughs> or I'll have our two guest uh, educators introduce themselves. Um, again, I'm Jim Rees at Washington International School. I'm in my 12th year at the school. And um, prior to that, I, I taught high school in um, DC public schools and Fairfax County public schools and overseas in an international school. So I'm, I'm back in the international school world at, at Washington International School, but do a lot of work around the city and around the region, supporting teachers in all kinds of settings and museums, but also in formal schools, but also in early childhood centers with um, an idea of, of Project Zero Ideas with the idea of trying to support teachers and how to use these strategies most effectively. So it's been my great pleasure to work closely with both um, Carol and to, with Cher over the years. And so we're thrilled to have them on board. And so I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves by just saying a little bit about um, who they are, um, what they do, where they work, um, the, the nature of their work, and just anything about their background they want to share just briefly with us. So Carol, why don't you start? Sure, my name is Carol Genex. I'm French-American, as you can hear a little bit with my accent. Uh, I work at Washington International School. I've been there for quite a while, first as a middle school and high school teacher, and then I moved to the upper school to teach uh, the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program uh, in Language and Literature and Literature. Uh, four years ago, I switched uh, roles, and I am now Director of Teaching and Learning. Uh, six to 12th grade. And in this capacity, I um, coordinate curriculum, professional development. Um, I give advice to teachers, uh, engage in interesting conversations about their pedagogy. Uh, so it's a very interesting switch from Project Zero Ideas in the classroom to Project Zero Ideas uh, at the administrative level. Okay. All right, Cher, why don't you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cher Anderson Petty. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone who is viewing us today. I am a proud third generation public school educator mm. with 25. Yeah, I know, right? I started when I was five um, <laughs> with, 20, with 25 years teaching experience. And I currently teach IB literature at Seneca Valley High School in Germantown, Maryland. Great. Thanks, Cher. And thanks, Carol. So why don't we just uh, start by sort of going backwards in time a bit. And if you could, uh, again, describe somewhat briefly your first experience being introduced to Project Zero Ideas and um, the kinds of reactions you had. And I think for both of you, it was as a classroom teacher. So um, Carol, again, you want to start us? 
Sure, and uh, it's very set in time. It was 12 years ago when Jim started to work at Washington International School, and I think it was his first faculty meeting. At the time, we didn't have much professional development, let alone, you know, like things that we would model during meetings. And then he did a See, Think, Wonder uh, routine with a very interesting Renaissance uh, painting. And I remember everything. So it was like love at first sight. I remember where people were sitting. I remember what they said. I was in the back, not saying anything. I was very shy, but it was kind of a haha -ha moment for me. And ever since I've used these ideas. So it was kind of a, uh, just a very big surprise to see that, first of all, you could model these ideas with adults, which was kind of new for me at the time. Uh, second of all, that you could have interesting um, sharing of perspectives all together. Uh, and also um, that, you know, it was very student centered, like you were no longer teaching from a, you know, teacher led uh, perspective. Uh, moving forward, I think I kind of took these ideas and made it made them on my own pretty fast. Uh, and then uh, so like the direct application in my classroom. It was also a way to validate what I was doing in a bit because at the time we didn't have many observations in our classes, we didn't have much feedback. And often I was not sure what I was doing, I wanted to experiment. And Project Zero really uh, put some words on what I was doing uh, and a lot of structure as well, because as you know, routines are very structured. Uh, you can make them your own, but you also have to kind of follow a certain protocol if you want everybody to have a voice and if you want to deepen the understanding. And I think that was liberating for me as well. So big moment for me. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm glad I was a part of it. Um, yes. <laughs> I, heard, I, heard you, I heard you say it was an aha moment. It made me think also it could have been a ha ha moment because I've had plenty of those when I've um, stood before oh, yeah. a class of, of students or before <laughs> teachers, but I'm glad it was aha for you instead of ha ha. <laughs> Good. Um, Cher, why don't you take us back to, um, to that moment or those moments when you were first introduced to Project Zero Ideas? Well, I was first introduced to Project Zero Ideas by um, a WIS faculty member, uh, my bestie, Carrie Richardson. Um, but my first real uh, hands-on experience was WISIT 2017 as a participant. And it could best be described as teacher Christmas. I mean, it. I am not hyperbolizing to say that it just reinvigorated my love for teaching and learning. Um, at that time when I came, I was at, I want to say year 22 in my teaching career, and I was feeling pretty burnt out. Um, but just hearing about the research base for best and the best practices that came from Project Zero, giving us the tools to build a culture of thinking, just lit me back on fire. Okay, great. I'm gonna ask Ashley if she might actually show us a blog piece that uh, Cher wrote for us about that um, teacher Christmas. Um, here it is, it's in the, um, <laughs> She can go to the website there. It's We have a, a organization at our school called the PD Collaborative, the Professional Development Collaborative that I direct. And on it, we have um, we have all kinds of blogs uh, from written by practitioners about their experience with Project Zero Ideas, as well as all kinds of other useful tools and descriptions of what we do. But there, you'll see it in the collection at the end. Um, and, and certainly if there'll be the link there where you can go and read what she wrote. But it was a lovely piece that Cher wrote that came as a surprise to us that she had such a positive um, reaction to it and, and gave it this name, uh, Christmas in July. We loved it. Um, there it is. And there's Cher. There's <laughs> Ron Richard. And some of the, the brainstorming ways or sharing that we do at WISIT on walls, making our thinking visible. We can't do that this year. <laughs> but we do a lot of... Um, a lot of documentation of the learning that we're doing over the course of that week. And let's just stick with WISIT. So thank you, Ashley. So let's just stick with WISIT. And both of you are on the faculty of this Summer Institute. It's um, it's a five-day Summer Institute called WISIT, the Washington International School Summer Institute for Teachers. And its objective is to um, is to try to introduce or to introduce Project Zero Ideas to educators in the district in Maryland and Virginia. And um, Cher came as a participant, as she said, the first year, but she's um, she's uh, moved on to becoming part of the faculty. And Carol was part of the leadership team from the from the first days when we got started with WISIT seven years ago. This year, we're going to have to make this pivot to uh, a, a distance learning to online uh, virtual WISIT. Um, so I just want to ask the two of you, thinking about your past experiences leading learning groups or working with educators in various ways, 
at WISIT. What are some of um, the, the ways that you have found to help teachers get their head around Project Zero ideas? What are some things that have worked? And if you want to also address maybe some of the obstacles, but I can bring that up as well if you want to just stick to the one question. What are some things you find that, um, that might work with educators when you're introducing them to these ideas? Do you want me to start here? Sure, go ahead, yeah. go ahead, Carol. <laughs> To me, like the big question is always differentiation and inclusion. Uh, we have educators from all kinds of disciplines, all kinds of contexts. We have preschool teachers with high school teachers. We have teachers teaching standardized testing. And so it's very important for me as a, for example, a learning group leader to make sure that they're going to make uh, these ideas their own. And so it's important to slow down, uh, to give it a reflection time. Um, some learning group leaders do wonderful things with journaling, making visual journals. We really try to uh, encourage them to have a, even a small line of inquiry throughout the week that they can go back to. Uh, we also have the through lines, which I think have been very, very helpful in order to kind of give them ideas on what they want to explore and you know have them day by day reflect on them. Uh, so for me, I think that has been key to the success of, of WISIT to make sure that at the end of the week, people get what they need, which is very different from, again, you know, a variety of contexts. And I think this is still a, a key moment for di distance learning, right? Differentiation, not everybody has the same experience and therefore you need to make sure that you're going to have strategies that are wide enough to cater to everybody, but that are meaningful enough that everybody can uh, find connections with their own discipline. Great, yeah, a lot to think about there. And I'm gonna invite anybody in the, um, in the chat box if you want to, to, um, to share perhaps when you first got introduced to Project Zero Ideas, um, what, what that moment was like. Ilsa made the comment that um, it was just interesting to see how everybody has a very clear memory of how the connection with PZ started. And I can, again, I can, I can draw from that memory as well. For me, it was well over 20 years, but it's still very, very strong in my, in my mind. So feel free in the, in the chat box to contribute questions and comments, and we can come back to some of those. But also, if you have a memory of when you were first introduced to those ideas, what it was like, whether it was positive or negative, um, feel free to, to jot those down. Um, Cher, what about you? Yeah, well, you led a, a learning group, and um, I'm just curious about what, um, what you find helps when you're um, having a conversation with a group of teachers or mm -hmm. maybe just an individual teacher. Well, honestly, uh, from the public school perspective, and we did have you know, public school teachers in uh, WISIT last year and previous years. Um, when I think of those teachers, you know, those hardworking teachers can sometimes feel overwrought, mm -hmm. frankly. And they just feel that they're just trying to get it all done. And, oh, my God, there's so much to do. And some teachers initially felt like, oh, God, is this just like one more thing to put on top of the 8,000 other things that I have to do? What I really love about Project Zero Ideas and about WISIT in specific is that they walk away being aware that PZ is not, yes, it does involve novel thinking routines, but it's really a series of things to put, to sort of give you a paradigm shift, actually, a paradigm shift in the way you approach thinking, learning, and teaching. Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's um, it would be instructive to hear from both of you about um, the way you might bring along colleagues. I mean, WISIT is a, is a special experience. And I, I do want to give credit to the Summer Institute that's held every summer at Project Zero itself, the Project Zero classroom. Uh, both Carol and I have worked um, there as, as faculty members and, and we modeled WISIT on that. We, WISIT is significantly different in some ways, but the model comes from that, that work that's been going on at Project Zero for over 20 years. But I'm just curious about when you get into the day-to-day um, sometimes the the day to day you know mundane life at school. How do you how do you have conversations with colleagues to try to bring them along to introduce them to these ideas and to maybe um, give them the, the the courage or the interest or the wherewithal to try something out to see how it goes in the classroom. Well, if I could jump in, sure. Jim, I have to say that from my experience, I actually don't have to do the talking. What winds up happening is students from my class have the idea of dispositions and thinking dispositions. And they understand that these are transferable skills. And so some of the thinking routines that we're working on in my class, other teachers begin to see, oh wow, so-and-so is not so much of a helpless hand raiser anymore. They're really thinking for themselves and problem solving. And I don't actually have to say anything. They just wanna come by and see what's happening. 
From my perspective, as somebody who coordinates or give ideas for professional development, I think giving a wide array of opportunities is key. Um, teachers have different schedules; they have different, you know, priorities. Some have final exams, while others have, you know, end of the year projects and so forth. And so we've had, you know, developed all kinds of tools for them to either engage uh, in discussions with each other or. Um, you know, uh, get some training. And so I'll just mention the learning groups that have been going on that Jim started many, many years ago, where uh, teachers discuss problems of practice around Project Zero Ideas and they commit for one semester. It's optional, so they don't have to do it. I think that's very important. You don't want to force people to do this or embrace these ideas. It has to come from the heart. And they meet twice a, twice a month and discuss these ideas brainstorm, uh, model things with each other and so forth. I created what I call flash PD sessions. They're 25 minutes, one-on-one -on -one PD sessions with me, um, centered around Project Zero Ideas again. And these have been very popular as well. It's, you know, there's a schedule, it's the, on their own time. And I've seen like really nice successes. For example, we have a chemistry teacher who you know, she experienced uh, the idea of exit tickets through drawing, so making really thinking visible and making understanding visible that she later presented at a chemistry conference during the summer and she did a webinar on it. So I like the idea of planting a seed as opposed to just give the whole tree to, mm -hmm. to everybody and even the forest, as you know, Project Zero is, is very wide. Uh, another thing we've done recently with my uh, colleague, uh, Jamie Chao Mignano, is that we've tried to pair up projects your routines and strategies with online platforms that could be really um, you know a good fit for these ideas and we've shared the documents and again that has been very helpful for for teachers so giving a multiple array of opportunities i think has, has worked well as opposed to saying okay we have two day pd i mean Wizard is, is something like this, but it's during the summer. There's this idea of Christmas, of a gift. Uh, but during the year, I think these smaller opportunities work best for, for teachers who are very busy. And we actually, Jan has a question in the chat. Um, are you using specific structure for the professional learning groups? Are they after school or during the day? Can you just talk, since we're on that, can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like? So our middle school and upper school teachers have uh, free periods during the day when they prepare or have meetings or assess. And then we take these free periods and try to match the best you know we can, these teachers who express the same interest. It doesn't always work, but magically it works most of the time so i prepare the schedule is logistically a little difficult and then we we go with it so it's never after their their hours it's, it's during the day um thankfully yeah and i'll say for our um primary school it's we're on, we have two different campuses at a primary school which is um pre-k three or preschool through grade five their their schedules are not as flexible as um the, the schedules of the secondary teachers so when they've when they've had their learning groups, they've had to do them either before school and after school. Mm -hmm. So they've found time. Oftentimes it can be um, that they have a standing Wednesday afternoon meeting. The children leave early from school, and they have um, they, so they have um, an early meeting, but then they stay later to um, to have their learning groups. So they find convenient time so that all people from different grade levels could come. So I think every school has its structure. So you, I think you just look for those opportunities and and try to seize them. And again, from the administration point of view, I think it's important to speak the same language and we use heavily Ron Richard's uh, eight cultural forces in order to kind of, you know, use this language of the cultural forces, either when we have a faculty meeting, when we have a discussion with a teacher, when we observe a classroom, it's a common language at this point. We presented uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the chart and ever since I think everybody's aware of of, of these forces that are at stake in the classroom and beyond. And so I think that's another important element because we speak the same language and I think we have the same objectives. So even if you have not been introduced to routines, for example, if you know that, you know, like uh, the cultural force of expectations relating to thinking or the cultural force of language and so forth, that really creates a bond between, uh, between teachers or teachers and administrators. Yeah, and Ashley, um, Hearing that uh, eight cultural forces mentioned, she's brought up the the chart that's in the uh, collection that we'll share with you at the end of this session. Um, but the eight cultural forces are there, and a, what what we see is sort of a rainbow wheel that has them all explained. 
um, as well. These come from uh, work that research that Ron's been doing with a team at, at Project Zero for many years, and it re and it culminated in a book that came out several years ago called Creating Cultures of Thinking, and um, and goes through each of those forces and gives ex concrete examples from classrooms around the world Ron has worked with um, to show how they play out and in powerful ways to to extend and um, and promote uh, powerful learning. Now, um, I will also say one thing I love about Ron's work and his writing is that he often will include um, stories from the field. So in Creating Cultures of Thinking, he, um, he, he brings stories from various schools and educators he's worked with over the years to tell their stories and every story is different. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a wide, uh, just a plethora of, of experiences to think about and to think about which ones might match up with your own or what, what strategies you might use as well. I think part of what sort of lit me on fire about Ron Richard's research, starting with his, um, I'm going old school, here we go, I'm going old school. <laughs> I, know, I know there's a new one, but I got yeah. the old one, he's a little dog-eared, but yeah. So starting with, with those um, ideas, when he talks about teachers enacting the curriculum, that really resonated with me. I do a lot of sort of teacher as text. And so the kids really get to know me and I'm animated and I'm, you know, really in action. And so this idea that we don't just deliver instruction or curriculum, we enact it. And then when he goes on to talk about how um, children, well, actually any of us really grow into our intellectual environment, mm -hmm. that really lit a fire under me because mm -hmm. it's like, um, there's, there's life beyond these, these tested standards. We're growing humans to be deep thinkers, to have responsibility for their learning, to have some global competence and care about the world within which they exist. Good. I'm gonna ask each of you a question, just to, um, you talked about the, the beginning point in your journey with, with Project Zero Ideas. I wonder if you might just share what might have been one of the most meaningful moments, like one, one if you could distill um, something you've worked on or something you've done, that stands out as kind of a, a special moment and just a little bit of explanation as to why. Well, um, as I said before, seeing the growth in my students as they come from, they stop being helpless hand raisers and become more active thinkers and problem solvers. Um, I think for me, the moment usually happens a few months in when they really do get that there are no passengers on our plane so to speak. In fact, that's kind of a motto of my class. There are no passengers on our plane. We're all crew and we're all taking ownership of our learning. I have my, this year I had my classes all in groups and uh, you know, some kids really get into it, some kids don't, but using the thinking routines and focusing explicitly on the cultures of thinking and what we do, the eight things that, that help us build this culture in class. Um, that I think made a huge difference with my kids. I mean, that I was being sensitive to things like time. Teachers rush, 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 rush. We wanna cram everything in. When I pulled back and looked at Ron's ideas of, okay, what's the big thing? What's the most important thing that has to happen in here? Instead of focusing on all the 8,000 details that come down the pike, that really helped. When I started looking at my language, Ron talks about uh, conditional language and how sometimes we shut down learners when we suggest that there's just one answer for something. So that's helping me. Uh, I, I say things like may, what may, you know, as opposed to what is. Um, and using my environment. Um, I know sometimes for public school teachers, it can be a challenge because we sh we're in multiple rooms. Um, I this year had the pleasure of having my own room. So I really use the walls in my room as sort of that co-teacher to sort of archive our learning experience. Great. Thanks, Jared. Um, before, Carol, before you uh, respond to the question, I'm just gonna invite in the chat box, it's very active in there, but I'm gonna invite if anybody, who, if you wanna write uh, maybe a thinking routine or two that you've particularly used um, to good effect over the years, some your favorite ones, or if there's some other projects you were practice or idea that has meant a lot to you, feel free to share in, um, in the comment section, uh, which will also be archived with, with this, um, with this webinar. So Carol, what about you? What's been a significant moment for you? It's hard to find a moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, I would say now in my job, it's when I see that the seed, it's, it's not even that I plant the seed uh, to go back to the metaphor of Christmas. It's more like 
I give, I have a lot of gifts for you. Here they are. And then some people choose to open them and then make something out of it. And sometimes there is a delay. I see three months later that somebody has used a routine I presented briefly in my newsletter and so forth. So I love that. I love to see the story of the ideas uh, coming to life. That's really one thing that is amazing. The other thing for me as a learner is that it's it's endless. It's endless. Right now we have a partnership with making uh, with Agency by Design with the Making Across the Curriculum project, and then all of a sudden it's like being, you know, back to square one, not knowing anything, discovering system thinking, discovering the idea of design justice. And so for me, I've been moving from visible thinking, and then when I thought, oh, I kind of not master, but I understand now visible thinking, and then I went to uh, teaching for understanding, and that was a new aha moment for me. And now. The latest is the making across the curriculum project. So being in this position of being a constant, you know, lifelong learner is amazing. Um, Thanks. Uh, we've got a lot of um, a nice list of, of some of my all time favorite uh, thinking routines um, there uh, for you to, to look at. And if you don't know some of these, then um, feel free to ask a question or to look it up. You can Google any of these and find out more. Um, we're going to make a transition in just a moment to the Learning Lab collection that Ashley has put together uh, based on what we've talked about today. But I'm just going to ask you to finish our conversation by um, by talking a little bit about the Learning Lab and what it's meant in your own work. So um, Cher and I worked yeah. together on a project last year called uh, Museums Go Global. So Cher, um, I just wonder if you might want to share what you love to. what you learned with Museums Go Global. Oh, I'd love to. It was so much fun. Check out Museums Go Global on the Learning Lab. It was just delightful. Um, first, you know, since I was teaching um, IB literature, you know, we have the focus on the MYP and the DP standards, and this seamlessly fit into that because every lesson is focused on global competency. Um, for me, I was thrilled because it mitigated uh, any access issues. When you're at high need schools and you have difficulty getting to museums, um, this eliminated that because, hey, we're right on our Chromebooks, we're at the museum, and we're not just pulling up anything on Google, no offense, Google, but we are having collections that actually have curated museum artifacts. We sat down and worked with museum curators to pull uh, objects for each of these collections. And the collections are great appropriate resources. I know for myself, sometimes I'll pull up something online that seems interesting. And then when I get down to it, I'm like, oh, that is not for 11th grade. Um, and then most importantly, I felt like who better to know what our kids need than the boots on the ground, the teachers? And these were all teacher created collections. Thanks. Um, Carol, what about for you, Learning Lab, and how has it played out in, in your own work? Yeah, I think it's the same experience that she has had. Yeah, some of our teachers have had collections and have used extensively the, the collection of the Learning Lab in order to enhance their teaching. I would also add, I don't have like very specific examples in mind, but I find also compared to Google or Pinterest or whatever it is, that you find very um, unusual artifacts and that sometimes it um, creates a new way or a new angle to teach something that is more provocative, that is deeper, and that really kind of question also your curriculum. And so I think that would also be for me a really good strength of uh, using the Learning Lab collections to teach. Great, and so with that, Ashley, we're gonna have you take us through the collection that you've created for today's session. Absolutely, thank you so much. It's been kind of fun to hear all of your trajectories through the Project Zero kind of from the very beginning when you were introduced to, I guess, what we're calling now Teacher Christmas in July, um, <laughs> all the way to where you've been today. And I've loved reading in the chat to everyone else's trajectory. It's been so interesting. Um, so on the screen right now, you should see um, a Smithsonian Learning Lab collection. Um, each week as we've been creating these sessions, there's been a corresponding Smithsonian Learning Lab collection to go along with it. Um, what I'll say too is that these are archived. So if you search in the Learning Lab, easy peasy, just like it looks like up on the screen, um, then you can certainly access the archive of these. Um, they're also listed within the YouTube description of each of the sessions too. So you have access to all of these resources. But quickly before we kind of close for today's session, I just wanted to show you what's available to you in this specific collection. Um, here, the first uh, image is uh, the understanding map. 
And so this understanding map helps you think about the, diff the specific types of understanding that you're aiming to reach with a student. So for example, um, wondering, what am I curious about here? Or describe what's there. What do you see and notice? And some suggested Project Zero routines that help get at the heart of those specific understandings. So this is a great tool to kind of um, think about the thinking <laughs> that you're um, trying to encourage within the classroom. Um, we also looked a little bit at the cultures of thinking. And so these are um, kind of summary cards. And I know it's difficult to see. Um, luckily, this is actually a downloadable PDF. So you can print it out or have it on, up on your screen. But it highlights things like Cher talked about. So she talked about time, environment, um, as well as some opportunities too. And so those are all elements within cultures of thinking. Um, as we move forward, you can see some examples from um, that were actually created by Cher. Um, so one was mm -hmm. from her Museums Go Global um, experience um, about art and resistance, uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, another one is actually one that she's been working on and kind of iterating upon um, during this distance learning time too. So um, she's teaching uh, the graphic novel Persepolis. And so she's used routines and museum resources to help support and supplement the big ideas within this text. Um, another example, and Jim, did you wanna speak just quickly about sure. this example? Yeah. Sure. So one of um, we've had, as Carol mentioned, we've had no, a number of our teachers at Washington International work with Learning Labs specifically to build model collections. And Emily Veras, who um, who's now teaching in um, overseas at the International School of Amsterdam, cr has created a number of collections. But she worked while she was at WIS um, in developing um, collections, and this one was really powerful on lactase persistence and human migration. Her students did phenomenal work, and so she's got examples of that in here, but also shows how she, as a biology teacher. Um, took um, took her students through this understanding and then it just opened up the world for them in terms of thinking about how things migrate, people migrate and bring things with them. Um, and it's been nicely attached to the Reimagining Migration project that Veronica Boixmancia is co-leading, um, Veronica being from Project Zero. Excellent, excellent. So lots of great examples from teachers, created by teachers using Smithsonian resources, as well as um, you would notice in uh, Emily's collection, she's also included some um, contemporary articles and things like that. So in addition to the uh, 6 million resources that the Smithsonian Learning Lab has to offer, um, you're also able to pull in different um, URLs or files that you have, examples of student work, all of that can be curated within the Learning Lab. Here we have um, a quick video to give context for Project Zero thinking routines. We have uh, the Project Zero homepage, which actually has a whole new toolkit of all of their routines in one place. It's really easy to find and navigate, so I highly suggest checking that out. Um, we also at the Learning Lab have uh, curated Project Zero thinking routines into a collection. And so you can see here, um, these are just a few of the routines um, throughout the Easy Peasy sessions. We've been including these within our collections too. And it's just an easy way to access and start to pair the thinking routine alongside uh, a museum object. We also have a blog post from the Professional Development Collaborative at the Washington International School talking about the Global Competence uh, Project Museums Go Global. And there's uh, Cher's reflection um, as teacher Christmas in July. And you can see Cher has a lot of fun when she's doing uh, <laughs> the Summer Institute. But it is part of that is also the community of practice that comes from that specific professional development too. And being able to bounce ideas off, off of each other and really get feedback from peers as well as kind of uh, lead facilitators too. I also included um, a few videos that might be helpful. There's four videos here, and these are actually from some of the work that Jim and I have done with Project Zero in Pittsburgh. Um, and so these are four elementary teachers who have um, actually modeled um, their direct student facilitation too with each of the routines that they're modeling alongside um, specific Smithsonian objects. And then they also do a bit of a debrief of what they were trying to accomplish within that learning session, as well as some of the things that they noticed that their students were doing too. So if you're interested in seeing what this looks like with real live students too, um, those four videos are really great um, examples of what's possible and how you might uh, transfer this to your own context as well.
I should mention that this webinar, as well as all of our Easy Peasy webinars, are archived. So you can access the webinar here um, or at the same link that you're watching it at right now. So feel free to fast forward or rewind to all the good parts. Um, if you missed a, a specific part, um, you can take notes um, or you can share it with a friend too. And then if Project Zero is something that interests you, there's also online courses that are available and you can access those there as well. So like I said, all of this is free. It's curated for you already, so you have access to it. And Wednesday's session where we're thinking about building a culture of thinking with museums will also um, have a similar collection for it as well. So we had two questions that have come up in the chat. Um, one of them is, uh, if what are some resources you can share to help someone get pra practically get started using these thinking routines in the classroom? I would say the book that Cher held up, well, there she is holding up again, Making Thinking Visible is, is Project Zero 101. It really introduces the idea of understanding, teaching for understanding, as well as um, the cultural forces, but it really zeroes in on the thinking routine. So to start with the thinking routine, I think is probably the best entry point whatsoever. And then there's Creating Cultures of Thinking, Ron's um, second book in this series. And the latest book to come out is called The Power of Making Thinking Visible, which is on order right now. Great. And then the second question, which is admittedly, Rodney says, a bit of a loaded one, is how can we better serve schools through technology-enriched practices? Great question. I think um, we're making this pivot with, with these sessions, and I see it happening all over the Smithsonian and all over D.C. now, and I think all over the world, to think about how do we leverage these practices in a distance learning environment. So I think there are a lot of great resources out there. Feel free to get in touch with me at Washington International School and, um, and my colleagues. I'll, I'm happy to put you in touch with people who are doing some really, really great, great work with Project Zero Ideas in a distance learning environment. Great. Thank you. Can I just say one last thing? Mm -hmm. I just want to say um, a big thank you to Ashley Naranjo, who is um, going to a new position within the Smithsonian. So she won't be with us in future easy peasy seminars or webinars, but her colleague Tess Porter will take her place. And we love Tess. We love working with her. But it's been such a pleasure to work with Ashley and a privilege. She's a great, great, great facilitator and thinker. And we're going to miss you, Ashley. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, thank you everyone for joining for joining us today. Um, we will continue working on our Meta Week on Wednesday where we're gonna have two museum educators joining us, one from the National Air and Space Museum and one from the National Gallery of Art, talking about the way that they've used um, Project Zero and thinking routines in their practices. Uh, so we hope to see you there Wednesday at one o'clock. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.